Good morning, church. Happy Easter. Let's go and stand on our feet this morning and worship. And let's sing this out. I was buried beneath my shame. If you could carry that kind of weight, it was my tomb till I met you. Yeah. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn. Let's sing it out. Till I met you. You call my name. Come on. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. gets a little bit more pumped up and we get a little more excited because Jesus is risen. My name is Joe. For those of you I haven't had an opportunity to meet, I'm one of the pastors here and our greeters and welcome team are all over me this morning saying some of y'all who've never been here before snuck by without getting one of these bags. So they said to me, if I don't say something about that, I'm going to be in trouble 
and I don't want to be in trouble, so y'all need to help me out. If you're a first time guest with us this morning and you did not stop by the Welcome Center, not trying to embarrass you, they're standing back there ready to hand these out. Just raise your hand, but just this high, so I don't want you to be embarrassed, okay? No, go stick those hands up. Look at the... Take that down there to her. Oh, I'm sorry, you're plugged in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we do so, so much appreciate all of you being here. And especially, as I mentioned, our first-time guests, we just want to thank you for being with us to celebrate a real glorious day because Jesus has risen. And in that bag that you just got or maybe picked up on the way in, there's a card. And if you would take the card out of there, just fill out the information. We don't sell those emails or anything else. We just want to reach out, give you some information about the church, and thank you for being here. You can drop the cards in either one of the offering towers or give it back to the representative at the Welcome Center or just hand it to anybody that's got those little name tags on that says, I can help. Because we do appreciate you being here. And if you're with us online this morning, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. And we do the same for you. We'd ask that there's a link right below what you're watching and let us know that you're with us. Thank you. We are here to celebrate a risen Jesus, but I want to just read one little passage for us just to set the tone and to set the mood for what Jeremiah is going to share because he's got a fantastic message this morning. In Luke chapter 24, Luke writes, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? You see, it's so amazing. And, and, and personally, I can take this Easter holiday for granted because we celebrate it every year. And we know that he's risen. But imagine, just imagine... Friday night and Saturday, all of these who have followed Jesus, and he's gone. They think that hope is lost. But then came Sunday. Why do we seek the living among the dead? Because we have a living, risen Savior. So I just want us to take a couple of moments right where you are right now. And if you know Jesus, think about what that means. And if you don't, today's the day. And Jeremiah's going to let you know a lot about, more about that in just a few moments. Father, how much we thank you that you loved us enough to send us your son. And Jesus... <laughs> I can only imagine the sorrow and the desperation that those folks felt on a Saturday. Desperation that some of us feel. And yet we have this incredible gift and this knowledge that, yeah, you paid the price for us, but you didn't stay in that grave. You conquered death that we might have everlasting life with you, and we thank you for that. And Jesus, it is in your name that we support that we bring this to the Father. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to praise and to worship a risen Savior, Jesus. So there was this moment uh, on, on Friday night where we had our, our Good Friday worship night, and Sorry, the other two services didn't get this. Uh, you're special. Um, but there was this moment that just kind of encapsulated the whole evening where we just sang this chorus that's called You're Worthy of It All. Um, and I kind of, the band doesn't even know we're going to do this. So I just want us to lift those up. The words are very, very simple. It just says, you're worthy of it all. For from you are all things and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. And that's the reason that we're here. Because he is worthy of it all. So I just like us just to sing this really quick just a couple times just to to get it in the air as we uh, before we move forward let's sing this together because you're worthy of it all you're worthy 
amerò For from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory Let's sing that again one more time You're worthy of it all For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. There was a moment when the lights went out. Death claimed its victory. The King of Love had given up his life. Oh, the darkest day in history. They're on a cross. They're on a cross they made for sinners. That's you and me. For every curse, his blood atoned. One final breath. Final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth, before the earth began to shake And the veil was torn, amen Your sacrifice was made As the heavens rolled declared in this place, all hail King Jesus, oh. and all hail King Jesus, and all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, and all hail King Jesus, oh. and all Let's sing it out.
For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Let's sing that one more time. You're worthy, declare it. Because you're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Heavenly Father, you deserve the glory. You are worthy of our affection. You are worthy of our lives, Father. God, as we've come together as the body of Christ to lift high the name of Jesus this morning, as we celebrate Easter, we celebrate the resurrection. God, I know that there's people in this room that don't know you. And God, I pray that the spirit would move and bring dead hearts back to life. God, that this wouldn't be just a moment where we could check off a box and say, yes, I went to church on Easter and I made mama happy. That your spirit would move in this place, that you would open eyes, soften hearts, that they would come to know who you are because of the work of the cross. In your name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Happy Easter. So glad you guys are here today. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 28. Two things I want to get out of the way um, before before we go into the service. Um, Number one, this is not a clip-on. This is a real real tie. My wife handed me a shirt and a tie and said, you're wearing this. And I knew from the, the way she said it, it wasn't a suggestion. 
It was what I was going to wear, and so um, this is all thanks to my wife. So <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. <clears throat> no, I, uh, she makes me better. I married way, way up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is, uh, I'm just going to be honest with you, this, this Easter has been, um, as, as, you know, every Easter a pastor faces this challenge, right, of how do we preach the same message in a new and fresh way? How do we make it something new that would excite you? And, and so there's a lot of pressure sometimes we put on ourselves to, to preach something that's unique and fresh and, and beautiful and that everybody will leave here in tears and rejoicing and, and, um, and, and knowing Christ. And uh, as I was studying this week and, and, and hearing other men, um, listening to other men and how they've studied this, uh, I was challenged with some ideas that I had never really thought of before, and I wanted to share those with you today, but these aren't original, uh, these, these aren't from Jeremiah Hamburg, but they are so good, and I think that this Easter has been one of the most deeply moving Easters I've ever had in my entire life, and, um, and it's all because of the resurrection. In 1989, in November of 1989, a wall fell, a wall that divided a city in half because of two ideologies that just could not coexist, and that wall was the Berlin Wall, and some of you guys are old enough to remember that and have seen that on the news. Some of you have read about it in your history books, but in December of that same year, a composer named Leonard Bernstein put together an orchestra. And this orchestra was composed of people from both sides of that wall who had been kept from each other for 30 years and were now able to sit together and play music for millions of people and tell a better story, tell a story of freedom, a story of unity, a story of love on top of the rubble of a wall that had divided for 30 years. For some of you this morning, that's what Easter is. Some of you this morning realize that he has torn down the wall of hostility and that now we sit united with God once again. So for you, I say happy Easter. Some of you are here, let's just be honest, because it's tradition, because grandma threatens your life every year. If you don't come with her, uh, you don't get fed this delicious lunch that we're all going to take part in. Some of you are here because the person beside you is pretty cute and you just want to kind of be with them. Some of you are here because someone invited you to lunch and you ended up here and you're like, what the heck? There's not even any food. <laughs> Some of you are here for all those, those reasons. Some of you are also here and you come every year because it's tradition and this seems like the sales pitch from a salesman who showed up on a bad day selling you something you don't really see the need for in your life. To everyone in this room today, I say I'm glad you're here. You are welcome here. I'm thankful that you're here. C.S. Lewis said this about Christianity. He said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. We all have to deal with this question. Who is Jesus? At some point in our lives, we have to cross that line. We have to deal with the question. And we have four biographies right here in this book we call the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that walk us through the life story of this man they call Jesus. We learn what he said and how he said it and all these things that he did and didn't do. And, and we learn all about his story through these biographies. And a few of the things that are so important to us that we learn about him is, number one, that he was a great teacher. Jesus was a fantastic teacher. Now, our culture is very comfortable with this. We're good with this. As long as Jesus is just a teacher, guess what I get to do? I can kind of come with my agenda and then just plug Jesus in. Jesus was all about this. Jesus was all about that. I can take Jesus and, and twist his words to fit my agenda. The problem with this is, is Jesus. 
From the very get-go, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, the anointed one, the Savior. His whole message was that the kingdom of God had come near and that he was the anointed one who would usher it in to our everyday lives. And not only did, was he a good teacher, was he the Messiah, but he claimed to be the Lord. In other words, he claimed to be the embodiment of the God of the universe. In fact, in John 8, we see him telling the Pharisees, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They knew this story well, the story of Moses at the burning bush as he stood there on holy ground and asked, who should I tell my brothers sent me to lead them out of Egypt? And what did he hear back? I am that I am. And they wanted to stone Jesus for blasphemy. Right here, he claimed to be Lord. Over and over in Scripture, we see this Lord over sin, over death, over creation itself as he calmed the storms that shook up these fishermen that had lived there all their lives on the seas and were scared to death. And he's, by a word, peace be still, and the storm stopped. We see him raise men to life. We see him forgive sins. We see him claim to be Lord. So he's a good teacher. He's Messiah. He's Lord. And he was crucified. You might say, Jeremiah, I've studied Roman history. There were a lot of people crucified. What's so special about Jesus' crucifixion? Like, what makes him any day? I mean, Jesus himself was crucified between two other guys who were being crucified at the same time. So, what makes this so unique? What makes this different? Well, his crucifixion was promised and given. This was planned from the beginning. That this crucifixion would mean something because it wasn't some series of unfortunate events where Jesus said the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time and kind of accidentally ended up on the cross. It was promised. Listen to Jesus' own words in Luke 9. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Talk about calling your shot. Jesus talked about his death often. In fact, Matthew tells us that he talked about it time after time. Like he, this was a big deal. Jesus had told his disciples this is going to happen before it happened. But not only that, Jesus' death was given. John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to what? Give his life. Give his life as a ransom for many, he would go on to tell his disciples or to tell the Pharisees that the greatest act of all was that one would lay down their lives for their friends. And then he went on to live out that ethic in front of us. This crucifixion was different. It was, it was not the act done by some tyrannical God who was just angry, but it was done as the ultimate act of love. And you might sit here and go, okay, Jeremiah, that sounds great. How do we know? How do we know that Jesus was who he said he was? Like, is, he just sounds like a cool guy. Maybe he was just a cool guy who did a lot of cool things, and then he died just like everybody else. Uh, a lot of people today claim to be God. I mean, you've seen it, right? Like, we see it on the news. These people claim to be God. They get a following, and then they die. How do we know Jesus was telling the truth? Pope Benedict has this quote. He says, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event and a person, which gives life a new horizon in a decisive direction. Christianity traces its very roots back to an event in history. This event was the resurrection when Jesus called a shot, and actually pulled it off. This is the event. No other religion in the world traces their, their history to an event. Christianity is the only one, a person 
and an event that sets life on a new horizon. This event means that Jesus could not be just some good guy or great teacher or somebody we should just admire. This event changed everything. In fact, Paul would go on to write in 1 Corinthians, he would say, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. If Christ is still dead in the tomb, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But something happened. An event happened. Let's read about that. Matthew 28, starting in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not Here, he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. (laughs) Like, hey. What's up? Like, no big deal. And they came up and took hold of his feet. He's not a ghost, not an apparition, not some figment of the imagination. They physically touched him, and they worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray. Lord, one more time, we ask that you would move through your word. God, give us eyes to see how the resurrection truly does change everything. Lord, help us today to take this word home, not to leave it here in the pew, but to take it home, Lord, to let it change our lives as you intend it to. Give us ears to hear today in Jesus' name. Amen. The resurrection is the climax of the story. It's like the pinnacle, the scene in the movie that you've been waiting for where good finally triumphs over evil. But it's only one scene in the story. And this would kind of be like if you, if you came in at the tail end of The Lion King and you hadn't seen the movie before it and you just see the last scene and all you see is this weird monkey thing holding a lion over a cliff. You wouldn't really know what, what's going on, right? This is why we've got to kind of go back and look at the whole story to really understand the power of the resurrection, the the idea that it changes everything. This is what I was so challenged with this week, is how deeply the resurrection changes life at its core. It sets life on a new horizon and gives it a different direction. And if it didn't happen, then we are to be pitied above all men. For we've given our lives over to a lie. But it did happen. And so if it happened, then it changes everything. Every worldview tries to answer questions. And there's really four basic questions that all philosophies, all worldviews are trying to answer. Origin, meaning, morality, Destiny. This is how did we get here? Why are we here? How should we live here? And where are we going? All philosophies are trying to answer those four questions. And today I want to show you how the resurrection answered those questions. So, origin, how did we get here? If you go all the way back to the beginning of Jesus, or G- Jesus, beginning of Genesis, you're confronted with a creation story. And this creation story is unique. You see, back in the day, all creation stories had these gods that were warring against each other. 
Okay, so like the gods, the Olympians were warring against Kronos and the Titans, and, and they were all fighting, and so the, whatever god won got to create, and it was an act of power. What do we see in Genesis? We see the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in what? Not at odds with each other, but in complete harmony with each other, with a love so unique and united. And this creation was done out of love, not out of power. In fact, if you look at the first few chapters of Genesis, this is exactly what you see. God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, united in love. Creator walking with his creation. You see Adam and Eve fully in the presence of each other. Naked and unashamed, united in this beautiful love. And then you have Genesis chapter 3. The lie is bought. The fruit that was forbidden is eaten. And immediately this is what we find out. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloth right away. As soon as mankind said, hey, we, we want to decide right and wrong. We get, to, we get to be God if we just eat this fruit. And as soon as it happened, we see destruction. We see disobedience lead to destruction, and a union was broken. And for the first time, we see guilt, shame, and fear enter the world. It goes on to say in verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord. God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. And so we see right off the bat, this shame, guilt, and fear separate man and woman. They clothe themselves. They cover themselves. They're ashamed. And then we see a loving God, a creator God, who was supposed to be knowable and intimate and personal and present, now becomes hard to know, unknowable, and hard to trust. And so they hide from him. And guilt and shame separate us from a loving creator. We call this sin. Guilt says, I made a mistake. Shame says, I am a mistake. And we deal with both of these things in dramatic and subtle ways. And we don't even have to look back into antiquity to see this. We don't have to do a deep study into history to see this. We can look around us today. This is, this is the 70-year-old woman who has hidden a part of herself because she was ashamed, because she, she was exposed to some unspeakable abuse as a child by her father. This is an abuser coming clean and actually stepping out and not hiding himself from his guilt anymore and saying, I was the abuser for years. You see, we see this in dramatic ways, but we also see this in subtle ways in our own hearts. Sitting right in this room, we'll find a desire to find some sort of acceptance and worth in anything or anyone. The common thread between both the dramatic and the subtle is that they're driven by fear, not by love. So Tyler Statton, who's a pastor over on the West Coast, says this. He says, you can choose another origin story, but you cannot deny the Genesis diagnosis. Something has gone wrong. It's broad and it's personal. This is an earthquake that destroys a city. This is a plague. This is a famine. This is genocide. This is school shootings. This is big, dramatic, and it's personal. This is my loneliness, my desperation to find someone who would love me. Creation tells me that we were created uniquely to be loved by a close and knowable creator who breathed the very life into us. Sin tells me that there is no way 
that that is true. And I have to find some version of that love somewhere else. But the resurrection tells me a different story. It tells me that the God who created by love will one day redeem by that same love all of creation and every part of me. That is what the resurrection tells me. Sin says I'm not lovable. The resurrection says I am. So what about meaning? Why are we here? We live in a live-your-truth culture, don't we? We live in these claims of exclusivity. I'm right, you're wrong, maybe we're both right, we'll just figure out how to get along, but there's exclusive claims, and don't let your truth triumph on my truth, and, and I'm trying to find meaning in, in living my truth, and look at where that's led us. Just take a step back and look at where we are today. We no longer talk to each other, we yell at each other, and whoever yells loudest wins. We no longer show grace to one another. We cancel each other. This is where our claims of exclusivity have led us, further and further apart in our guilt and shame. I think there's a, a deeper definition and understanding of truth. We, we look at it as an exclusive claim, but I think uh, the, the ancient definition of truth is really more about direction. If you had a bow and an arrow and you had a, a good arrow, it is finely tuned and crafted and designed to go where you aim it. So wherever I aim that arrow and release, that arrow is going to go that direction. We would call that a true shot. The arrow was following the path it was set on. And so this begs the question for us, if we look at truth like that, we have to ask ourselves this question, is what I am letting define me? is what I am letting give me meaning, taking me where I want to go. Is what I'm finding meaning in taking me where I want to go? Am I finding hope or discouragement? Am I finding fulfillment or just more emptiness? Am I finding peace or anxiety? Is what you're allowing to define you, to give your life meaning, is it taking you where you want to go? Is it true? Jesus says a few statements that make it kind of unavoidable to talk about meaning and leave him out. <laughs> He's pretty much the only person in the world that says, I'm the meaning of life. And he said this in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. He says this in John 10, 10 I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is making claims here that he is the meaning of life. And the resurrection isn't just about security after death. It is about that, but not just about that. We have this idea that the resurrection is just like your, you know, get on the get on the life raft card. You know, you show to the captain and when when the world blows up, you get to get on the life raft and live somewhere else forever. No, Christ has redeemed all of creation. We're not going to live in heaven forever. I'm going to get a new body. I'm going to live on a new earth. And the resurrection tells all that, but it's not just about that. It's actually about life right now. I have hope right now. My eternity started when I came to faith in Jesus. It does not start after I go into the grave. And so now, guess what? I don't have to do the deep dive into self, which is just kind of weird and confusing. I get to live for something outside of myself, something bigger than myself, because the resurrection happened and tells a better story. And I'm invited into that story to live a life that's full and abundant, just like Jesus said. I can have meaning right now. This is the orchestra playing on the rubble. Yeah, we know what's happened, but there's hope right now. And I'm pointing you to hope 
We are making beautiful things happen right now on this rubble. I can have meaning beyond myself, which is so freeing. There is so much freedom there. And I can have this meaning every minute of every day because the resurrection is true. And it gives me meaning. What about morality? How should we live here? We, we can tend to look at morality as kind of a list of do's and don'ts. If you grew up in a Baptist church, you've probably seen like the list of do's and don'ts. They do that really well. Um, and, and if we're not careful, that's all morality is. You just follow this list of do's and don'ts and you're good. But I, I, I think there's a deeper meaning to morality. I think there's something more nefarious actually going on with the morality that we try to live in our world. I, I think morality is, is more of a way of life between the shame and the guilt that come from the fall. So I would say this, morality has become our desperate attempt to hide our faults and flaws behind actions that either help us escape the truth of our lives or help us look better than we really are. This is the addict who in an effort to hide the shame that he feels, hide the guilt that they feel, runs to drugs or alcohol to forget And what they find is when they sober up, the shame and the guilt are still there, and so they have to go back and keep forgetting. This is the person who says, I'm a good person. As long as I'm better than you, I'm great. And they try to cover their shame and their guilt by morality, by work ethic, by whatever. You pick your poison. And these things almost work. And it's hard to give up things that almost work. This reminds me of a story in Mark chapter 10. Jesus is walking with his disciples and this young man runs up to Jesus. And and in this culture, and even probably in our day, if you would have seen this young man, you would have thought, he's got it all together. He's a rich young ruler. And he runs up to Jesus and he says these things. And there's this little phrase at the beginning. He says, hey, good teacher. And Jesus stops him and he says, why do you call me good? And I always thought that was interesting. Why would Jesus stop him from calling him good? He said, no one, no one but God is good. And I think Jesus was saying, I don't need to hide behind morality. I am who I am. What you see is what you get. There are no loincloths, no fig tree, no fig leaves covering. Here I'm not hiding behind morality. And this rich young ruler asked this question, how do I inherit, what do I have to do to get eternal life. And Jesus says, well, you know the law. And he starts to weed off the law, and this young man's like, yeah, I've done all that. I've done that since birth. And then there's this other phrase that I love. It says that Jesus saw him, and he loved him. And he loved him enough to say, one thing you still lack. Give all your possessions away to the poor. Now, we preach this, and I think rightfully so, against idolatry, right? Don't put it, you can't love God in money. Don't put anything before God. If you're clinging to something more than you are to God, then it's an idol in your heart. But I think there's another layer to this story. Because we're told that the rich young ruler went away sad. And I think it was because he realized in that moment that his morality was never going to be good enough. That following the law was never going to be enough. He had done it since birth. People would have looked at him and said, God has blessed him. Look how rich he is. Look at the power he has. He must be doing it right. And so for him to have to do one more thing, I can't do it. I cannot make it. But the beautiful thing about the story is that Jesus saw through his morality and saw his guilt and his shame and what? Still loved him. In all of that guilt, in all of that shame, through all of this good person stuff, he still loved him. The resurrection tells us that even though our righteousness is filthy rags, even though our morality will never add up, Even though there is nothing we can do to earn eternal life, Jesus is enough. 
That's what the resurrection tells us. We get to put on his righteousness, his good works, because he was who he said he was. This is what the resurrection does. Do you see how it changes everything? I had a conversation with my wife just this week. And it was, um, it was a good conversation. It was an unexpected conversation over a bowl of oatmeal, and, um, which, which all good conversations happen that way. And, um, and I was challenged on this thought. I, I don't know how good I am at just acknowledging the fact that God sees me for who I really am, flaws and all, and loves me. And like dances over me, delights in me, just as I am. I have this little guy in my head, right? He's got, he's got a cape and an S on his chest. And if I don't live up to him, then guess what happens? Shame and guilt attack and tell a story in my heart. And this week, I think it finally hit me. Because I think I finally see how the resurrection tells me. And I, I, I don't have to live up to the Superman. I'm not supposed to be him. I'm just supposed to trust in the love of Christ who would come to this earth and die and be raised again for me. And that while I was still an enemy, still far off, he did all that. And then we have destiny. Destiny. I was in um, Haiti at an orphanage, and I can still remember um, a little girl named Emanuela's face. Uh, she had been left on a trash pile to die in another city, and somebody had found her and brought her to this orphanage. And she was rigid and had a brain injury, some kind of disease. And when you looked at her eyes, there was nothing there. It was just kind of empty, and, and, but she was breathing. And I remember for probably the first time in my life being confronted with, with destiny, with suffering and death. And I remember being angry. And I'm, I got a master's degree in apologetics. Like I know all kinds of big fancy words. <laughs> and if you want to argue about let's prove the resurrection, we can have a conversation about that. But at that moment, those weren't enough. And I had a lot of questions and a lot of doubts. And I had to take those before my father. Is this what is this? What is this? Why is this? I can do nothing to help this little girl. And I wrestled with that for years. Suffering is... It's tough to look at. But I know the resurrection changes the story. Because I know that when Emmanuela breathed her last a few years ago, that she was with Jesus. And I know that at the resurrection, she's going to have a brand new body that works. And she won't be left on some trash pile. All of these wrongs in this world we're gonna, are going to be made right because of the resurrection, because we don't have a God who spoke to us from some cloud and stayed separate from us, but he became one of us and suffered like we do and endured like we have to. One who walked the way for us and promised never to leave or forsake us, to continue to walk the way. He's the way, the truth. And the life. Every year, uh, if you watch all the New Year's Eve specials, they usually do a somber moment where they have some, some headshots of people who have gone on before, people that we've lost. And we take a few minutes and look through those headshots and realize death wins 100% of the time. It's our greatest enemy. And it has a 100% track record. Leo Tolstoy, who is a Russian novelist and philosopher, said this. If there, in fact, this was a question 
that he asked himself at about the age of 50, and he almost took his life because of this question. He says, is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? All of these things that we try to cover ourselves up with, all of these things that we we think will give us meaning in life, that six-pack that you're working so hard to get and keep, right? It doesn't matter at the end of life. Those people that invited you to all their fancy parties don't matter so much at the end of life. All of these things that we try to cover the shame and the guilt of our lives in mean nothing at the end of our lives. There is nothing that death does not take. Unless, unless the resurrection changes that. And our Savior now holds the keys of death and the grave. Jesus said this in John eleven twenty five: 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he die. First Peter 1, 3 through 7 tells us this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith or salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuous of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because of the resurrection, I no longer have to fear death. Because of the resurrection, I can find meaning in suffering. And because of the resurrection, I look forward to the return of Jesus. I was talking with a friend this week, and she shared with me this story. There was... Uh, a culture, uh, a, a custom uh, back in this day when, when you would eat dinner at a table, there would be a servant waiting on you and they knew not to touch the table as long as you were eating. And the way you would tell them you were done is if you took your napkin and balled it up and put it on the table. That meant I'm done and the servant was okay to come and clear the table. But if you took the napkin and folded it and then set it on the table, it meant I'm not done, I'm coming back. Don't touch anything. We just read about an event that happened and these women that go to a tomb and Matthew doesn't tell us this, but some other gospel writers do, that when the disciples looked into the tomb, they saw the burial cloth of Jesus. And guess what it was? It was folded up and set where he lay. He was coming back. He was not finished. He didn't ball it up and throw it in a wad in the corner folded it. You imagine you just resurrected from the day and you fold your clothes. (laughs) But that's the kind of savior we, we have. Jesus is going to return and he's going to blow away all this smoke. He's going to clear away all this rubble and all of creation will be redeemed and every part of you will be redeemed. You do not have to live a fractured life. You don't have to just show Jesus your good side. You don't have to prove anything to him. We can live whole in front of him. And so we've got to ask the question, what do we make of this? Is this just some tradition that we do with our grandparents every year and afterwards we kind of hunt eggs through a yard? Is this something that a salesman is offering us at a bad time that we don't really need and don't really have a desire for in our life? Or could it be that the resurrection is the sound of hope on the rubble of our lives? The sound that 
that tells us there is hope, not just for tomorrow, but for today, that changes our origin story, that gives us meaning, that causes us to come out of hiding, that changes our destiny. Could it be that the resurrection literally changes everything? And so today, I leave you with this quote. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. So as we close this morning, my prayer is that for anyone in this room who finds themselves hiding their guilt and their shame, trying their best to cover their flaws, to look to the resurrection, it is proof that you are lovable, that God does love you, that he pursues you, that he is chasing after you. Even right now, you might feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart. My wife is here. I'm here. We're, we would love to introduce you to Jesus this morning, to this resurrected king, our living hope. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so good. I praise you because you are our living hope. You are seated right now at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And Lord, right now I pray for anyone in this room who does not know you, that they would come to know you deeply and personally and intimately, that this Easter would be as deeply moving for them as it was for me. May you be glorified in our response to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing one more song?
Easter. Listen, uh, we got a couple of quick announcements before you go off. Next week is our Serve Sunday. We take every fifth Sunday, but Easter was the fifth Sunday this, this month, and we thought we shouldn't cancel Easter. So we moved Serve Sunday to next week. We're actually going to be meeting over at the Quarry, which is our building behind Cardinal Bicycle on 460. And uh, we're going to be serving our city in many, many different ways. And so you can look on our website and find out if there's a team you'd like to join and be a part of that. We would love to have you. But please register just so we can put teams together and make sure we have you in the right spot and there's work to be done. And it's a great opportunity. So don't show up here next Sunday. If you do, you're going to be by yourself. Uh, show up over at the quarry at uh, 9 o'clock next Sunday morning. Also, two weeks from today, we're going to be starting a brand new series, Walking Through the Letter of Jude. And so that's one, that's the least preached book in all of the Bible, and there's a lot in there for us. So we would love to invite you to come back and join us for that series. Bedrock Roanoke, you are sent to go live out and rejoice in Easter today. We'll see you back here in a couple weeks. <laughs>